Uh, it's good to see some of you back that were gone. I know I was gone for a little bit, but you were gone too, so it's so great to have you here uh, today. And it's a very special day, a very important day. Uh, it's, again, a new year, 2015, and 2015 will bring with it its own challenges. Everybody knows that we will have challenges in this coming year, but also the great blessing of God is going to be with us. New things have come. Old things have what? Passed away. Hey, that's right. So remember that in 2 Corinthians, okay? So you guys want to look at 2 Corinthians 5 and to remember that. Well, let's get into it. Do you remember a song, and I'm not sure how many of you were involved in the youth group movement years ago, uh, but we used to have times where we would get around a campfire, and the guitars would come out, and we would sing, and one of the songs that was real popular in that day was a song that you and I would probably remember, the older of us would remember it, and that was, It Only Takes a Spark. To what? to get a fire going, and soon all those around will warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread the love to everyone you want to pass it on. You want to pass it on. The second line goes like this. What a wondrous time is spring when all the trees are budding. The birds begin to sing. The flowers start their blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to sing. It is fresh like spring, and you want to pass it on. Do you know something about life? If you look at any study of life, whether it's in the uh, microbial world or you look at it into the larger world of the of the invertebrates and the vertebrates and you get into zoology and you look into plants and all the different kinds of things of life you one thing you see in life is, is that life reproduces itself it is necessary to reproduce itself it is the essence of life to reproduce it as god designed it to be reproduced after its own kind we reproduce and so new christians should produce new christians new and that's just the way it is. So you know, life is always about passing things on, especially important things. Well, there's many metaphors used in Scripture. Uh, I'd like you to turn, if you would, you don't have notes for this, so turn in your Bible. That's the book that tells us what we need to do, written to us by God, so we can know. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 for our text this morning. It's a simple message today, very simple, and it's a simple text, not complicated. There's so many metaphors that are used in Scripture to help us to understand and appropriate truth. 2 Timothy 2 has a few. Let's look at them. He says there, you therefore my son, that is the Apostle Paul, and he's speaking to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. And the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Now, as Paul was addressing this to Timothy, he had a specific thing in mind that he was telling him because Paul knew the time of his departure was soon, and he was handing things off to Timothy and to other men like Timothy so that they, in turn, would carry on the work of the ministry. And that was a part of the life of the church. And in this, there's three metaphors that were used. Life was likened to three things. The first one was warfare. Everybody knows that in life, warfare is something that we we don't actually want to do. There's not many people that really want to go out and have a war. But you know, life is full of wars. And it doesn't have to be a world war. 
It, it can be wars and conflicts that we have with each other. It can be wars and conflicts that we have with uh, the world against us. It can be wars that we have in our workplace or in school. War is a part of life because in this life there is a battle, a, uh, an eternal battle that goes on for eternal life. And that is for versus death and evil and good and God. This battle goes on all the time. And so we, when we get up in the morning, it's much better for us if we have this frame of mind. Life is like a warfare, and I'm getting ready to go out. We've heard a sermon recently. I'm putting on our spiritual what? Why do you put on armor? You don't do it to go swimming, do you? Well, unless you really know how to swim with heavy weights on, you don't do that. Because armor is designed for warfare. It is designed to protect you because of a battle. The second thing we see in here is life is called a race. In this case, he uses the word a competition. And he talks about striving for a prize, which later in other passages in, in Corinthians, he likens it unto a race. And we see that life is like a race. And in that, there's, a, there's so much involved in it because you don't go out and compete without practicing. You don't go out and compete without training. You don't go out and compete without dedication. And so we wake up in the morning, and now not only are we in a warfare, Timothy already probably understood that, he likens it to a competition and how important it is to compete according to the rules. And the third one is for farming. And he talks about the hardworking farmer who goes out there and has to, has to put in all the blood, sweat, and tears to develop the land and may or may not see the crops come up because he doesn't know whether the rain will come or the crops will be eaten by a pest or an enemy will come in and burn his fields. And so life is looked at in these metaphors and things that we can understand. And Paul is looking at Timothy and teaching us some of the same truths about how to approach our life. This morning, we find that the race is the best metaphor for our message. Specifically today, I want to talk about the relay race. Back in, uh, back in September of 2013, I was uh, asked to write an article for The Voice magazine. And back at that time, I had uh, been giving some, a lot of thought and, dis and, and prayer over that article. I don't, I'm not a writer. I'm not asked to write things frequently. And so I was asked if I would write it. So I didn't want to just sit down and jot off a note. I wanted to make sure it said something that was important. And something that they asked me to do was something that was important to me. Well, what I wrote at that time was an article that's a short article called The Exchange Zone. And it deals with the athletic field of track, particularly in the relay races. Now, you know, some of you I've shared with you, I had experience in track all the way through junior high, high school. Track and field was very important to me. And I, I was not a relay race runner. I was in the field events uh, predominantly. I did run the hurdles, and I also did do, at one time, the half mile. But then I grew up, and I realized that that was not for me. And so I passed that on to the others that didn't mind running 100 miles a day. And, uh, and I stayed on the easy events, the jumping and throwing events. You don't have to run a long way for those, you know? So I did those events. But nonetheless, I have had experience in taking teams to uh, different meets, regional meets, district meets, and of course the state meet. And having been a coach in it, I understood the importance of what this metaphor means when it replies to the faith. But something happened in that time that made me really aware of how important it is to carry that on in the nature of the faith in the church. And so I wrote this article. I had a lot of different things going on at the time. And so this morning, I would like to read the article to you. For some of you who have already read it, you have already know what it says. But I think I would, if you would, just listen to this because of the weight of the ideas, okay? I quote with this, one message to take from Baton Blunders. This is the headlines. U.S. track has hit rock bottom. It was Thursday... August 21, 2008, in Beijing at the 24th Olympiad. It was the worst performance by the United States track program in memory. 
ESPN commentator Pat Ford wrote at that time, twice in an inept 30-minute span, the Americans fumbled the baton in preliminary races and eliminated themselves from the 400 relays they historically have owned. In a meet that, was a meet that has revealed the precipitous decline of U.S. track and field, the twin tink tinks of aluminum hitting track heralded the arrival of rock bottom. Have you ever heard that sound of a drop baton when it's being run? I've heard it too many times. Tink, tink, the sound of the aluminum hitting the track and bouncing. It would be hard for Olympians to pass through the public gauntlet unscathed by average performances, but to embarrass your country and yourself by neglect to basic details was unforgivable in the final analysis. Well, at least that's what the world sportscasters concluded. Isn't it interesting how critical we can be when our team lets us down with a dropped pass, or a strikeout with two outs in the ninth, or a field goal that is wide right at the end of the game? How do our heavenly observers view our competition here in this life? How are we, you and me, how are we faring with our team goal that was given to us by our coach in the Great Commission objectives? Have we dropped our baton on the track? How will people look back at our race in the final analysis? Paul the Apostle reflected the games of his day when he wrote to the churches in 1 Corinthians 9.24. Do you not know that those who run in a race, they all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Again, in Acts 20, 34, as he shares a last message with his elders in Ephesus, that I may finish my course, he talked about, and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God, to finish my course, he said. And then he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course again, he says it in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. These metaphors allude to a higher race and a much higher analysis. Often preachers liken it to the grueling 26 plus mile long marathon. And the emphasis is often on running your race with an individual's success as motivation to persevere. However, is it really about only doing our thing to the end? Is it only about me? Well, yes, it's clear that we all run in a race, but what kind of a race is it? Is it a sprint? A distance race or a marathon? Or is it more akin to the relay? Ah, the relay race is so much more than just be, being fast or having talent. It's about the team and the stick. A simple tube of aluminum. The baton carried by each member of the team. And then across the finish line. It's not just how well you run your leg. It's about how successfully you pass it on to your teammate. On a typical 400 meter oval, exchange zones are 20 meters long. The baton handoff must take place within that zone. A violation within the zone immediately disqualifies the team. Fumble, drop the baton, your team is done. Just like the infamous teams of 2008. I'd like you to consider three words as we talk about the baton. First, the team. When we are talking team, we mean participants, not an audience. Today, we have an audience. You're listening to me speak. We're not talking about an audience that watches the athletes. You go home and you watch a championship game. You're an audience watching those who are putting everything on the line. When we're talking about a team, we're talking about those who are involved in the competition, not those who are watching, those who are involved. And so the team, we're talking about participants, not audience. In a track relay, there are four athletes per team. 
Each runs their own leg. Our team, talking about now in the faith, is not restricted in number, but it requires that each team member to be in the race, running with all their heart. This analogy means we need to look at our churches differently. It's not how many are in the stadium watching. So often we see that today. How many are in the service watching some show take place? But how many runners leave that group and go out striving to win their leg? God's word highlights many relay runners, for our example. Who are some of those that we should look at? John the Baptist. He ran a rugged leg in his time. And while John was completing his course, the word of God says, that's his race. John the Baptist completing his course. How did John run his race? Well, he perished at the end. When John handed off his baton, he died in the exchange zone. But the baton was successfully passed on to so many. Who ran the race with Paul? Men like Barnabas, Timothy, Silas, Titus, Luke. Peter, Paul handed off the baton to these and countless other people, and he encouraged them to do the same. Serving Christ is done in his body. It is corporate in nature. It is about team. It is not about me. The church does not belong to a pastor. He is a player coach serving the head coach to whom the team belongs. It's about running with stewardship, the idea that everything belongs to God and not to me. The team. Second word is the baton, the stick, that some of the track athletes often refer to it as. We do not carry an aluminum stick, but the faith, because faith encompasses many meanings in the minds of the church. We need to clarify what we mean. There are at least three biblical aspects of faith, and it's essential to understand these distinctions. And I cannot repeat how important it is to understand when the Bible speaks of faith, you need to identify which of the three faiths it is. The first aspect of faith is saving faith. The faith taught in the gospel, the faith in Christ that saves a soul completely. The jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Saving faith is the faith that saves. Once it's enjoined, it lacks nothing. Its effect is eternal. Once you've been saved, you're no longer lost. You put your faith in Christ, you have eternal life. So when you have saving faith, once you have it, it's yours forever. The second aspect of faith is called your faith. Your faith. The faith taught in the gospel is your faith. The beginning, it begins with saving faith. The moment you trust Christ as your Savior, you now begin something in a journey called your faith. You have saving faith that gives you life in God. Now you begin your faith with God. This begins this and it matures until we arrive in heaven with the Father. It's subject to growth. Sometimes your faith grows as you read the word. You're involved in fellowship and you pray. Your faith grows. But there are times when you're not doing those things and you're doing the wrong things. And your faith begins to wane. And your confidence in God goes down. And your, and your assurance of many things start to slip away. But that's because your faith is dependent upon you and what you do with the faith. It's an interesting thing in here. It can grow and it can wane. Paul writes to Timothy, answer the phone, Timothy. I'm sure he said that. You know, that's a good reminder. If you didn't turn off your phone, good time now to do that especially the loud ones, you know. <laughs> at, least it wasn't, uh, at least it wasn't the Macarena going off, okay? So <laughs> that is a little distracting, but uh, anyhow. Okay, so now we've really embarrassed some poor soul, so I'm, I'm glad I don't know who it was, and you don't either. Okay, so anyhow, the second aspect of faith is called your faith. Okay, and uh, he says here, Paul wrote to Timothy, our brother and God's fellow servant, 
in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, 1 Thessalonians 3.2. Paul also wrote to believers in Rome, now accept the one who is weak in faith. You see, you can be weak in faith, Romans 14.1. And he also says, quote, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God, Romans 14, 22. And it differentiates that one person's faith can be stronger than another's and that one is not better than the others and one is not necessarily weaker than the others, but each one must live according to their own faith. And that is where they are in the faith of the gospel. Now, clearly, there are times of discouragement and weakness in believers as they run their course. Our faith depends on our walk at the moment and whether we are growing in the word, which bolsters our faith. That this is our faith, something powerful that motivates and guides our run while we are in the race. The third aspect of the faith is the faith with the definite article, the faith. This should be called the whole counsel of God. Many references in scripture to this. It is our baton to carry and to hand off. We carry and we hand off the baton, the faith. It is the faith Jude wrote that we should earnestly contend for the faith. Regarding that verse, A.T. Robertson explained that this faith is objective. It is not subjective, it is not part of you, it's something outside. For the faith it's talking about here, not in the original sense of trust, but rather the thing that's believed in. What do you believe in? This is the faith. This is what we are about to hand off. And what we've been entrusted to is the gospel in the church. It is this aspect of faith that Paul writes to the Philippians. You are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for what? The faith of the gospel. And again, it's echoed in Ephesians until we all attain to the unity of the faith. This is the baton that we must grasp, carry, and pass on. The last term is the exchange zone. What is the exchange zone for the Christian? It's a place and time. It's always today, right now. Our race is won and lost today. It's a moment of opportunity to pass our baton. We must pass the faith on to the next runner. But who could that be in our life? Who do we pass the baton to? What's well, an easy answer? Look who's around you. Who has God put you with? Look to see who's running with you. Who's serving with you in the work of the ministry? Who's eager and responsive to the word? It might be surprising how many are waiting to receive the baton and they're waiting for us to pass it to them. We may ask, why are many faith batons being dropped to the track? Well, I think no sense of urgency or purpose is the likely reason. We can easily become involved in the structure of church business while becoming deadened to church life. Don't we see a sense of urgency driving the early church leaders? How could Paul establish a church plant in weeks at Thessalonica? Well, we struggle along sometimes for years or never even do one at all. Hmm. Of course, they are apostles, you might say. Well, aren't we similarly called to follow their example? Aren't we told that we have the same power of the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you a question as if I were talking to you directly right now. Where are you in your race? Have you intentionally planned to pass the faith baton? Or are you just going to go and throw it in the air and hope someone will catch it and then run to the next station? The biblical relay runner trusts his coach and he runs according to his well-designed plan. He said, and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Our coach has laid it all out for us. He monitors carefully our leg in the race. 
and he places faithful runners with us in our lane. We are to look for them while we fix our eyes on the exchange zone. The handoff must take place. We just have to hand it off without fouling. Why was Paul so careful to make foul-free passes? He said, I buffet my body, I make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Like Paul, we must also compete according to the rules, run our leg, and complete the handoff. The U.S. men's 2008 relay team failed. Quote, they were in a close race when Darvis Patton came around the turn and he reached with the stick. Anchor Tyson Gay reached back. The baton hit his palm for an instant. And then the two men separated and tink, tink. It was lying on the track. They just stared at it. They lost focus on their task, and they lost their chance for gold. How are you doing in your race? Have you been focused or distracted? Have you lost sight of the goal, or are you pressing on to those waiting for you? Remember, we're all in the exchange zone today. Hebrews 12 says, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For considered him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you don't grow weary and quit. I put that in there, and quit. A lot of times we quit. Well, that's the article. I've added a little bit to it, not much. Where does it go for us today? I realized at the time when I had that published, that the metaphor was for me, and strongly so. I was in my exchange zone, not just in the day-to-day -day exchange of things that take place out of necessity, the things that we are to do every day as a part of an active member in the team, sharing our faith with Christ, encouraging one another, but I realized that I was in my exchange zone of my life, and I'm coming into my final quarter, and actually in my final quarter, one of the things you may have noticed in that last year and a half is that the urgency and my care for Southwest Community Church has dominated my thinking and my preaching. I realized that training and preparation, trying to prepare people for doing their job, your part in the race, trying to be the coach to get you ready for the race, I realized that the race was on for real. It's on for real. Now the time has come for me to hand off the baton. Linda, would you come up? We are announcing a plan today that in effect is a handing off of a baton, a big baton that we've been carrying since May of, two, of 1989. And that is that uh, coming up in July, I will be turning 65. And in July 15, uh, I will be resigning from the church. And I will be, in effect, in a semi-retirement mode at that point. Issues with our parents, both Linda's dad and my mom, are calling us to have to make many trips up the state. We've been doing that now for a number of months, but we are gonna to have to do more. And so we have to have a change in roles. 
and it's been something that we've prayed about over a period of time. We believe God is in this. It's the right thing to do. And so we've committed all this to the Lord. And so we are just announcing to the church officially that in July we will be retired and there will be a plan of transition that will take place in our exchange zone. It's not gonna be 20 yards, okay? It's gonna be a little longer than that. That only takes a microsecond basically to cover 20 yards. But it's going to be in a matter of months. Things are going to take place in which that transition will take place. And we're going to keep the church in, the, in our deepest heart and prayer. And we have no intentions of leaving at this point. We will be simply involved here as much as we can be, but that will be in a diminishing role. And so we are in the process of handing that off now. For the details on that, I've, I'm going to have our elder, Henry Ketzel, is going to come up and share some things a little bit more on the details, and uh, we appreciate your prayers. Lynn, do you want to say something? Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't tell you that. Can you say something? That's, that's a loaded one, because this has been my life. Our lives. For so many years. I can't talk. Everybody smile. Well, good morning. We've heard the announcement from Pastor Birch. Now your question is what's in the future? After many, many, many meetings, many, many hours in prayer, the Board of Elders has unanimously voted to offer the position of senior pastor to Reverend Cody Wallace. During this time period, during this process, pastor has recused himself from any voting, any input other than holding us up in prayer. We all know Cody. He's not the little kid running up and down the hallway anymore. But a man who started working with our youth in 2000, um, 2002, over 12 years ago. He was hired as our youth director in 2006, as a youth director, and since 2010, our youth pastor here at Southwest. Cody has spoken at various private and public schools sharing the gospel whenever and wherever possible. With his wife, Meg, they have done counseling in marriage. They have done couples counseling. With those that are seeking marriage insights. He's performed marriages, baptized babies, and been involved in funerals as well. Cody Current is working on his master's degree, struggling through one semester at a time, one course at a time, through Liberty University. His development of the Living Sacrifice Discipleship Manual, really an offshoot of something that former youth pastor Dave Robbins, one of our missionaries, uh, started way back when, back in the 90s and mid 30s, uh, 30 years ago. Some of that material is being used through the IFCA to help other churches discipleship, disciple other people. The process is one disciples one that one has been discipled, then disciples somebody else, and that chain continues. That's the idea of the discipleship. We feel like he's ready for the challenge ahead. And I know as a congregation, all of us will not only be praying for Chip and Linda in the days and the weeks and the months to come from them, but also for, for Cody and Meg. We've been blessed by having these folks here for some 25 years. Total ministry is what, probably close to 40? 33. 33? Oh, I was Seven gonna give you more than 33. Seven as a missionary. Yeah. Of course, they, they were uh, missionaries down in the Keys with Youth for Christ for several years. Uh, go back, even foreign missions to Mexico for a while. We're familiar with their history. We're starting a new history today. I would ask you to lift them up in prayer. Obviously, I'm going to ask Cody and Meg to come up now, if you would. 
May our Father in heaven continue to have his blessing on this many Southwest as we seek his wisdom as a board and as his pastor. Can we all stand as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer? <clears throat> Father, we uh, uh, come to you uh, this morning, Lord, to praise you, to uh, thank you, Father, and uh, to give you all the glory and honor, Lord. Father, uh, we thank you this morning for uh, Chip and Linda, Lord, and uh, for their ministry and dedication to you and to this church, Father. Lord, uh, 25 uh, years of many things, Lord, many sacrifices, uh, many challenges, uh, many laughs, many tears, Lord, and uh, we just praise you for them, Lord. Uh, we, uh, we thank you, Father, for what they represent to us, what they will continue to represent to us, Lord, for the way they uh, influence our lives and uh, the way they minister to each one of us, Father. We commit them to you, Father, as they uh, move on and we, they face all their challenges with their parents, Lord, and, uh, and with other things to come, Lord. But we know that you are the God who knows the future, Lord. You are the one in the future, Father, and that your plan is perfect, and each one of us in this church is, is part of that perfect plan, Lord. So we praise you. We pray for your protection upon them, for your provision upon them, Lord, for your blessings upon them, Father. We pray, Lord, that uh, this church will continue to be united in prayer for him and for this ministry that belongs to you, Father. Lord, we thank you again for mm -hmm. Linda and for Chip. We pray that you will continue, Father, leading them. Father, they are with us in our hearts, and they will always be, Lord. We thank you so much for the, what they've done for this church, Father. And we pray that you continue, Father, in whichever way is in your plan to continue using them for your glory. And, Father, that your name will always be exalted because of them, Lord. Thank you. Bless them, protect them, lead them, and guide them. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen, Lord. Heavenly Father, as we truly celebrate this bittersweet moment, we, your children at Southwest, come to you humbly to ask you that you continue lifting us with your Holy Spirit and that no decision will ever be made that does not come from you. We pray, Lord, that at moments like this, when we feel rejoiced because there's a new future, in sight, but we also say so long to a wonderful past. We pray, Lord, for Pastor Cody and Meg as they assume new responsibilities in their lives, and I say their lives because this is not a job, this is a ministry that involves your whole life. I pray, Lord, that you give us here, our children and your children in Southwest Community Church, the wisdom, the ability to sustain them, to give them the strength that they need to cope with all the ins and outs of a pastoral ministry. We ask you, Lord, that you bless Cody and Meg greatly, that they may lead this flock to approach you every day more and more, to be more like you, be more like your son every moment that passes in our life. I pray, Father, that this new beginning will be a wondrous and glorious beginning for your church and that it will be all done in your name. I pray, Lord, that you guide us all in the sense that we will be here for you, your church waiting for your son's return. And we pray, Father, that you be with us all this time. Bless the ministry of Southwest Community Church, that we may be here another 35 years from now. <coughs> with those that are young in our congregation, we might not be here, but those that are young, at one point, will probably be passing the baton unto another minister. We pray, Lord, that this will be continued in our lives till the moment 
you return for us. We thank you, Father, for the blessings, but having been such a central part of all the analysis and decision-making, we thank you, Father, for you being the final and utmost decision-maker in all of this. We pray this in your precious and holy Son's name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you, and I just want to let you know uh, that the transition is going to take over in the near future. There will be an actual change, and I'll be stepping down as a senior pastor, and I'll be taking on the role as an associate pastor at that time. And uh, so that will be announced ahead when that's going to take place. But uh, I'm very excited about uh, the future, and also it's uncertain. And so you face these things without knowing what it's going to be, but I read Genesis 12 many times. And when the Lord told Abraham, I'm going to tell you to go to a place, and he said, where's that, Lord? And he said, we don't know. And so we don't know what I'm going to be doing. We don't know where it's going to be. I don't have another job I'm running off to. I've never, this has been my only uh, life for, for the majority of my life, it seems like. And uh, so we're leaving that in the Lord's hands, but we're just confident that he is the one that's leading, and uh, we're confident in the and uh, the direction that the church is going, and we're very confident in the fact that this team that we have here at the church is going to carry on until the Lord's return uh, or until he calls us home, one way or the other. So until then. So thank you again, and we appreciate I, that. I Linda? have my composure now. Okay. <laughs> I took her off guard. I'm sorry. You should never, guys, <laughs> never do that. Okay. I just want to share, because God is so good. He's so faithful in everything. And we, we've been gone. It's been a whirlwind of emotion for me with my dad's uh, care and everything. And I had left my Awana book here for someone to do the lesson for me because I knew Friday night I wouldn't have time to prepare. Well, when I talked to them, they said, oh, they couldn't do it. And, and so I started to get a bad attitude. And um, then I said, no, God says to rejoice in everything and everything give thanks. And so I spent from 8.30 to 3.30 working on details of my dad's care and everything. And then finally I got my book. I forgot totally what the story was about. So I opened up the book, and wouldn't you know, the story was about Elijah and Elisha. And those of you who know the story, it was so beautiful. And they had, um, I got all my props together. I got my rake from the shed. Mm -hmm. I got my farmer's hat, and that was going to be Elisha, and I, as I played the role of Elisha, I found my Elisha, and I had my coat, and the thing that was so special was when I was going through my dad's things, I found, because uh, he had been collecting a lot of stuff, I found this brown coat, and I thought, that's a nice coat, I'm going to take it. Brought it home, washed it, it's a big, heavy winter coat. I'm thinking, what do I need this for, you know? But when I was getting my props together, there it was. It was the perfect coat, right, Heidi? <laughs> Heidi helped me out because she's my helper in Awana. And so I put that coat on Heidi, and I taught the children about passing it off. But it was God's special way for me because I had no way to remember that that was a story that I was going to have to teach and that you come under that protection. And that's what the Lord is so good because even in things that we don't understand, he's there. And even my daughter, Meg, praise God for Linda Love, who ordered a ladies Bible study book that was for children and she didn't know it. <laughs> and it was about change, so she handed it to Meg last week and said, here, maybe you can use this with your kids. Well, Meg read it and it was perfect. It was a little children's book, but she read it to me this morning and we both cried together because it was so perfect. And I was like, those are those little God things that you can't orchestrate. You can't plan on, but God's there, and he's always there for us, and I just praise him. This is my home of ministry. I started here when I was, when I was in college. college. I came here. College. College. Before we were married, before we ever dated, she was working I didn't even, didn't even know here. him, but I worked with youth ministry here over in that little building over there. We found that little building. We dug it out. We scrubbed the floors. We painted. That was our youth room. And I worked with the teens there. And so when That's I right. met Chip years later, um, you know, when we had gone to Mexico as missionaries short term, um, and he said he needed to find a church with a pastor who loved the Lord, who had been serving people, loving people for years. I said, I know one. 
Southwest community. This is where I ministered when I was in college. So we came back here, and that's where we've been. So that's why I cried when I brought that up. Because <laughs> I've been here a long time. So anyway. But we love you guys. And, Amen. Uh, you're in our Likewise. hearts. Likewise.